Today's video will continue our discussion of what it takes for triangles to be congruent. We'll be using in class 19 as our notes for today. If you'd like to find that and follow along, that would may be helpful. So what's different about today than what we've talked about previously is that in order to identify one of our five triangle shortcuts, we may need to also use some additional information, which might have shown up in previous standards or might be new for this standard. And what that additional information will tell us about will be either congruent side pairs or congruent angle pairs, depending on what the information is. So as you'll notice, some of these are review. The definition of midpoint is something that we've been using since standard one. So if we think about what it means for A to be the midpoint of segment CE, that would focus in on this particular portion of this diagram, since they talked about point A and segment CE. And we would be able to mark that these two segments are congruent as a result. So we would have segment CA congruent to segment EA, which would be in these triangles an additional pair of sides that we wouldn't know about without that particular piece of given information. The next one is also review. The definition of angle bisector is something that we studied in standard two. So if segment GI bisects angle FGH, that means that it divides that angle into two congruent parts. And so we would be able to name the top angle, angle FGI, and we would be able to say that that angle is the same size and shape or is congruent to angle HGI. So that time around, the definition of angle bisector would provide us with an extra set of congruent angles that we could use if we were dealing with these two triangles. The next one is also review from standard two, vertical angles theorem showed up anytime we had an X shape and we were concerned about those angles that were across from each other in the X. So for this diagram, angle BAC would name the one that's on the left side of the picture and angle EAD would name the one on the right side. And again, that would be an extra pair of congruent angles, thanks to vertical angles theorem. The definition of isosceles triangle is something we learned about in standard three. We never wrote down our reasons for standard three, but we definitely learned about what the word isosceles meant. We knew that when in a triangle was isosceles, it had two congruent sides. And so what we have to be careful of when we're dealing with proofs is that we understand which sides those are. That's why they've given us this clue about the base. So if the base is segment UV, that, that is actually the side of the triangle that is not congruent to the others. So if we're investigating triangle TUV, TU would be one of the other sides and TV would be one of the other sides. So those are the two that would get the congruent marks. We'd be able to say segment TU is congruent to segment TV thanks to the definition of isosceles triangle. And those are sides of that triangle. The base angles theorem is also from standard three. The base angles theorem was what we did when we had congruent sides present and we ended up traveling across the shape to the opposite angle. So we're gonna ignore this segment in the middle and just think about this isosceles triangle, this outside boundary, and we're gonna to travel to the opposite angle from this congruent side and the opposite angle from that congruent side. So we end up with angle P and angle Q as being the two angles that have equal measure or now are congruent thanks to our base angles theorem. So that gives us more congruent angles to use in our congruent triangle situations. Moving on to the next one, the right angles theorem is next. This is a new one. So is the bottom one, the reflexive property. The right angles theorem talks about what happens if we have a right angle in both of our triangles. The definition of a right angle would tell us that each of these angles measure exactly 90 degrees. But if they're both 90 degrees, we would be able to say that their measures are equal to each other 
because 90 degrees equals 90 degrees. And anytime we're able to say measurements are equal, we can change that into a congruent statement by dropping the M and changing that equal sign into a congruent symbol. So angle Z will be congruent to angle G because they're both right angles. So right angles theorem will be a new way for us to get additional angle pairs that are congruent. And then our last new option is going to be called the reflexive property. The reflexive property happens when things are shared by both triangles in the picture. So most of the time, it will end up looking like this diagram right here, where if we focus in on segment CD, segment CD ends up being a side for triangle CDB, but it's also a side for triangle CDE. And so even though it's only one segment, since it would be the same size as itself, I know that seems weird, but things are the same size and shape as themselves, we can say that segment CD is congruent to segment CD itself, and that counts then as a set of, shoot, I didn't mean to circle that, a set of sides because that side is used in both triangles. Now, I'm not going to get rid of the fact that I circled angles because reflexive property can actually be used for angles as well. That would happen in a picture like this one. So this is not quite as common, but it is possible. I'm going to focus on triangle FHI, so that orange triangle. And I'm going to try to pick a color that will make this one look different. Triangle GJH. Okay. So when I outline that, I'm not sure if you can tell because the colors kind of bleed together, but down here in this corner, that angle H was orange because of my first triangle, but it was also purple because of my second triangle. And so if that angle, again, is used in both triangles, it's shared and it represents one of the three angles in each triangle, we can say that that angle H is congruent to itself, and then that gives us a pair of congruent angles that we could also use as we're looking for different uh, side, 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 angle, side, or any of the others that we've studied so far. Okay, before we flip the page, we need to add one more detail to the bottom of yours, and it might not be there like it wasn't there on mine. So go ahead and fill in underneath reflexive property, definition of right triangles. This is going to be a reason that we're going to use when we don't need to make anything congruent, but we're doing a proof that involves hypotenuse leg. And the reason why that's required is that in order for a hypotenuse to exist, we have to be in a right triangle. And so if we're going to use hypotenuse leg, remember the side across from that right angle is the hypotenuse, and then either of the legs that form the right angle could count as the leg, so maybe these two are congruent. We have to confirm in the proof that we're dealing with a right triangle. And so if we have right angles, it might be that we want them to be congruent like if we're going to do side angle side, like would be the case up here. But if we're going to write an HL proof, then we won't write that the angles are congruent. And instead, we'll say that triangle ABC, that would be this triangle here, and triangle DEF are right triangles as part of our proof. And the definition of right triangles is the reason that we know that. If a triangle has a right angle, then we know it will be a right triangle. We'll see examples of when it's right angles theorem and when it's definition of right triangles on the back side. But the moral of the story is if you have right angles, you're going to need to choose wisely between those two, depending on what kind of reason you're going to use for your proof. And so what will you do with all of this? Well, if you go ahead and turn to the back side of that page in class 19, we have several examples of situations where our goal is to decide whether or not the triangles are congruent. And along the way toward that goal, we're going to think about our different criteria, but we're also going to think about other ideas that are true based on either how the diagram looks or based on given information that we are told is true.
So if we look at what's happening right now in these two triangles, I see one pair of sides and one pair of angles. These angles here are marked with those X's, so they're the same size. Well, if I have one S and one A to use, that's not going to be enough because as a recap, our choices are side, 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 angle, side, hypotenuse leg, angle, side, angle, and angle, angle, side. We covered those in, in class 18. And so just having one S and one A leaves me short of side, angle, side, and it leaves me short of angle, side, angle, and angle, angle, side. So thinking through our options that we just discussed, we're not going to be able to use either of these definitions because we don't have any given about a midpoint or an angle bisector. I don't see the X shape that would be necessary to use vertical angles theorem. They haven't told me that I have an isosceles triangle. I don't see congruent sides in the same triangle like I did here for base angles theorem. There aren't any right angles to spot. So the only thing that might help me out is this reflexive property idea where we have either a shared side or a shared angle. So in this diagram, I think I spot that happening right here. That TG segment is a side for the top triangle and a side for the bottom triangle. So I can mark it with a congruent tick. That means that I'm using the reflexive property to say that it's congruent to itself. And then that gives me another S that I can combine with my previous two, which means that side angle side is an option. As long as, I'm gonna color code these sides that match, the angles that I know are included between the sides that I know, which they are. They're right where that pink and yellow highlighted side pairs come together. So these are congruent, and the reason for why would be side angle side. So taking a look at number two, again, I can't use any of those definitions uh, because I don't have any givens with definition words in them. But I do see that I already have two sets of congruent sides. So I know that segment AB matches segment HB, and I knew that segment CB matches segment MB. So I have two S's to use, which means I either need to figure out something about the third pair of sides or the angle where those sides intersect. These third pair of sides don't seem like they have anything marked on them. So I'm gonna look at the place where these sides intersect and I feel like that is familiar. A nice X shape with angles across from each other. That would be vertical angles theorem that would allow me to mark that this angle is congruent to that angle. So these triangles are congruent, and they would be congruent because of side angle side again, but with a different additional reason than the previous one. Moving on to example three, I do see a vocabulary word. So just like in those previous standards, as soon as we see that vocabulary word, we know that that's gonna be a reason, definition of angle bisector. I just need to figure out what to mark on the picture as a result. So if we look at angle DCR, angle DCR, that's going to get bisected by CE. So what I should be marking is right where all of that highlighter comes together. That angle is going to be congruent to that angle. So that looks like it gives me two sets of angles. But if I only have two A's, again, I'm short on information. So even using that definition is not enough. Now I do notice that that bisector actually is shared by both of these triangles as well. So I'm gonna use another extra reason, that new reflexive property, to mark that that segment is congruent to itself, which now gives me an S. So if I have two A's and one S, in a moment, I'm going to choose between angle, side, angle, and angle, angle, side. But either way, I know that that means these triangles are going to be congruent. So now if I'm choosing between these, remember the important thing to pay attention to is the location of the side. So is that orange highlighted side connected to both of the marked angle pairs or just one? 
And that orange side travels from that angle marked with the O up to the one that I marked with the star. Same thing in the other triangle. So that means that that side is connected to both of the marked angle pairs. And this is an angle side angle situation. All right, row two. Moving into example number four, we have one set of congruent sides. We have one set of congruent angles. So one A and one S is available. By themselves, that's not enough. But I'm noticing, like I did in example two, that I have this nice X shape, that nice X shape, which means I can mark those same vertical angles that I did in example two. So vertical angles theorem would be the reason why I'm able to add those labels on those angles in the middle of the picture there, which means now I'm up to two pairs of angles and one pair of sides, just like I was in example three, and I need to choose very carefully about where that side is located, connected to both sets of marked angles or only one. So if I look at this triangle, that yellow side that I highlighted is marked and connected to angle C, but it's not connected to angle E. Angle D is empty. So this triangle is angle, angle, side. Does the other triangle match that? Here's your side. It's connected to angle C, this part of it, and it's not connected to angle M. So angle, angle, side. So that side is only connected to one of my sets of congruent angles, not to both, in example four. Moving ahead to example five, I don't notice any definitions because I don't have any vocabulary words, but I do notice, because I'm getting good at spotting these things, that there is a side that these two triangles share in common. So I can use my reflexive property to mark that that shared side is congruent to itself, which means I now have one, two, three pairs of congruent sides. So side, 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 SSS will be the reason why those triangles are congruent. Looking ahead to number six, I feel like the same thing is happening. I have a shared side. That side DC is used by the top triangle and the bottom, so I can mark that it's congruent to itself, thanks to the reflexive property again. But even with that marked, I only have two pairs of congruent sides. So without more information, without any of the angles being marked, and without knowing more about these remaining sides, this is going to be a no. None of our criteria fit with only two pairs of congruent sides. So we don't have enough information to say that those triangles are congruent. All right, two rows down, one to go for this page. So in row number seven, I notice right away I see the word midpoint. So I'm going to use the definition of midpoint as an additional reason. I just need to be careful that I know where that midpoint is located. So I'm going to highlight segment TY because that's the one that that given talks about. So that means that the two parts of segment TY are going to get some tick marks thanks to the definition of midpoint. That brings me up to two sets of congruent sides, which means I'm still looking for one more piece of information to try to match one of my triangle criteria from in class 18. I do notice though that it's got that nice X shape again, so that means we've got some vertical angles available thanks to our vertical angles theorem. And if I look really carefully, I'm going to go ahead and color code this other set of congruent sides. It looks like in both triangles, that angle is right where the congruent sides intersect. So those are congruent by side angle side, since that vertical angle is the included angle between my congruent side pairs. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at number eight. Number eight has a given up top that involves a vocabulary word. So we know we're going to end up using the definition of isosceles triangle. And if we think back to our work in standard three, whenever there was an isosceles triangle, 
that meant that it had two congruent sides. So when they give us this clue about the base, that's actually going to be the side that's not congruent to the other two. So if we're outlining triangle B, C, E, the base will be different than the other two sides. So we'll be able to add some of our congruent tick marks onto side B, C and side E, C, thanks to that definition of isosceles triangle. Now I'm also noticing as you're hopefully getting good at spotting, we've got this shared side in the middle between C and D. So we can put a tick mark here to say that that's congruent to itself. That's going to be the reflexive property. And I move that up a little bit because I'm going to have a third reason for this triangle. So I'm trying to leave myself some space to be able to squeeze that third reason in. Right angles are also given to us in the picture. And if you remember from the other side of our work, right angles always require an additional reason. We're either, we will either use right angles theorem if we need these right angles to be congruent, or we'll use definition of right triangles if we're going to have a hypotenuse leg proof. So now is the time we need to decide. It looks to me like if we travel to the side opposite the right angle, they are congruent. So those are the hypotenuse sides. And then this reflexive property segment CD is one of the legs in both of those triangles. So this is in fact an HL proof, which means we need to show why the H and the L exist in the first place, which means we're going to have to use the definition of right triangles to explain why we're allowed to use H's and L's for those instead of just S's. So three additional reasons for this one. The definition of isosceles triangle, gives us the hypotenuse sides, the reflexive property gives us the leg, and the definition of right triangles allows us to call those hypotenuse and legs instead of just S's. So this is a congruent triangle situation thanks to hypotenuse leg. All right, let's go ahead and finish out the last example here, example number nine. We have some information already marked on this picture one pair of congruent sides and one pair of congruent angles. And I'm noticing like so many of the other pictures, we have another opportunity to say that this segment is congruent to itself with the reflexive property. And then all of a sudden, I think we're pretty much done with this one. We have two pairs of sides, one pair of angles, and those angles are, if we do a quick check, in between the two pairs of congruent sides, right where those yellow and pink sides intersect is where we find those angles marked with those circles. So these are congruent triangles, thanks to side, angle, side, an angle right in between two congruent side pairs. Now you'll probably notice that there is still another page of in class 19. Depending on your teachers and whether or not they're going to do this whole lesson in one day or two, you might be able to stop here if you just missed the first day of the lesson. But if you know you're going to miss the second day of lesson in class 19, that's what most teachers end up focusing on the next page for. So if you want to continue on, that's fine. But if you know you're only supposed to do the first two pages, then go ahead and stop here and you'll pick up with the next examples in class tomorrow. All right. On this last page, we're doing the same thing that we did for the others. We're trying to decide whether any additional reasons are in the mix. And then we're also trying to give a congruent statement to go along with our reason for why the triangles are congruent. So if we start by thinking about A being the midpoint of segment BE, A is the midpoint of segment BE. So we're focused just on the left side of that picture. That would allow us to add some congruent marks there, thanks to the definition of midpoint. I'm just going to abbreviate the word definition since that blank is pretty small. I don't think we need any additional reasons because I'm noticing two pairs of congruent sides and one pair of congruent angles. So if I do a quick check to make sure everything is in the right order, it does look like those angles are where the congruent sides intersect. And so these triangles would be congruent by side angle side. Triangle CBA is a name for this top triangle. So it's going to be congruent to another triangle. So start out with a triangle symbol. 
CBA is going to correspond to DAE if you travel those congruent features of the triangle in the same order. So along the congruent side to the congruent angle and then away as you travel that other congruent side. Moving ahead to the next example, it looks like we have two sets of congruent sides but no vocabulary words, no shared side, no vertical angles. So there's nothing extra that we can write down, which means if we're stuck at just two S's, that means that this is not going to be a congruent situation. So we're not gonna end up using the A if you're gonna try to figure out the answer to the riddle at the bottom. Moving to the next one, I see two pairs of congruent angles. But technically, if these are both right angles, I need to explain how I knew they were congruent. So if I'm gonna use these as something other than HL, I need to explain that the right angles theorem actually tells me that those right angles can be used as a set of congruent angles. I think we're gonna need to do that because I don't see congruent hypotenuses, which means if we focus on using our reflexive property, to get at least one set of congruent sides, we would have the L for HL, but we wouldn't have the H. We do though have two angles and one side, so we need to make a good decision about where that side is located to be able to fill in our reason. Is the side connected to both marked angles or only to one? That orange side is connected to the right angle and the star in both the top triangle and the bottom. So this is gonna be an angle side angle situation, which means I need to fill in my congruence statement. So triangle EHF is the bottom triangle. E is the angle that's not marked, so that would correspond with G. H is the right angle, so that corresponds with itself, H. And then F is the angle with the star, which corresponds to the other part of angle F with the star. Moving ahead to row number two, I see two pairs of congruent sides and one pair of congruent angles. So that seems like enough for side angle side, but I'm gonna do some color coding here to make sure that that angle is in the right location. And look at that, it's not. It's not in the location where those congruent sides intersect. So that means again, without any additional information, we don't have vocabulary words or reflexive property or vertical angles, this is not going to be a congruent situation because we need that angle to be in a different location than it is. So those are not congruent triangles. On to the next one. I see right angles, which could be used as congruent if I use right angles theorem. And I see a second set of angles. Currently no information about the sides. Now I could put this shared side onto the picture, thanks to the reflexive property. So I'll go ahead and do that. And then we can make a decision about whether we need the right angles theorem as well. That shared side would be the hypotenuse if I was investigating HL, but I don't know anything about the legs. And so that means that we need to use that right angles theorem so that those right triangles become right angles that are congruent so that I have two A's and one S available to use. Now if we're looking at that orange side that we marked, it's connected to the angles with the star, but it's not connected to the right angles. So unlike the last time, our side is only connected to one of our marked angles, which makes this one an angle-angle side situation. All right, triangle ADB. So that travels from the right angle to the unmarked angle to the star angle. So I need to travel in the other triangle, make sure you have the triangle symbol, from the right angle, C, to the unmarked angle, B, and then to the star angle, D. One more in this row. 
All right, I already see a vocabulary word in this one. So we're gonna use definition of isosceles triangle. If we think back to what the isosceles triangle tells us, we're supposed to make sure that we're not focused on the base, but the other two sides, so that would be AB and CB, end up being congruent thanks to that definition. So we can add those marks onto the page. And then I'm noticing once more that we have this shared side in the middle that's part of both triangles. So I'm gonna go ahead and use the reflexive property as well, which means that I'm up to one, two, three pairs of congruent sides. So SSS will make those triangles congruent. Triangle ADB will be congruent to triangle if we look at A, there's no marks in the angles, but that's where the yellow and the pink sides come together. So that will match the single tick and the double tick here, the yellow and the pink, letter C. D is where the single and the triple, which is yellow and blue. So that's gonna match with D on the other side. And then B is where the triple and the single come together, blue and pink, and that matches with B on the other side as well. Now there is a second way to do that problem. If you want to avoid the reflexive property, after you mark your isosceles triangle sides, you could travel across the shape to these opposite angles and mark that A is congruent to C. That would be your base angles theorem then, instead of reflexive property. And then we wouldn't have three pairs of sides, we would have side angle side instead. So that's another one where there's two options, two potential ways of showing that those two triangles are congruent. Two rows left. So when we're looking at this next problem, I already notice an issue. They've given me two sets of congruent angles and I would be able to mark a third set here in the middle. That's your vertical angles theorem. But even if we mark that, we have no information about sides in this picture. An angle, angle, angle is not an option. So these two triangles are not going to be congruent because we don't have the right information to match with one of our five triangle criteria. Moving on to the next one, I see that word isosceles again. So we're going to use definition of isosceles triangle. Being careful to notice which one is isosceles, they've said BEC is isosceles with base BC. So here's the base, and then triangle BEC. So BE and CE would be the other two sides. So those would be the ones that I would get to mark thanks to that definition. It looks like that's enough to focus on these two little triangles out at the edges. I see two pairs of congruent sides, and then right where those sides intersect, I see angles that are also marked as being congruent. So that would be a side angle side situation. Triangle ABE, ABE travels the single tick and then the double. So that would match with triangle DCE. That also shows that angle C and angle B are those corresponding congruent angles. All right, one more for this row. So I'm looking at these two triangles and we already have a pair of sides that are marked as congruent. And then I'm noticing these right angles again. Remember, we've got two options when it comes to right angles. So let's go ahead and notice this shared side in the middle that we can mark as congruent to itself, thanks to the reflexive property. And then we'll see how we're going to best use these right angles. If we look back up here at N, that was a very similar situation and we decided to use the right angles theorem because we already had another pair of congruent angles and that made either angle angle side or angle side angle a good fit. In this case, it was angle angle side. For this one, I think we're in a different scenario because if we check in to see if we have congruent hypotenuses, the answer is yes. But unlike last time, we also have congruent legs. So this is going to be an HL proof. 
which means we don't need any congruent angles, so we won't need the right angles theorem, but in order for these two to be H's and L's instead of sides, we are going to need that definition of right triangles that we added onto the bottom of our graphic organizer at the beginning of this whole thing. Again, that's only because this is an HL proof. We don't need congruent angles. We just need right triangles. If we're taking a look at triangle USR so that we can finish our congruent statement, it looks like U to S to R would travel the reflexive property side first and then up to the right angle. So in the other triangle, that would be going from S to U and then down to T. So triangle SUT, we'll name that in a corresponding way. All right, on to the last row. One more for this row, and I'm noticing that I have those right angles again. So I'm going to need to make a really good decision about whether I need right angles theorem or not. So first things first, I'm going to talk about that shared side in the middle because we know our reflexive property is going to let us mark that that's congruent to itself. And now let's investigate. If we travel across from those congruent angles, that would be the hypotenuse for both triangles. So that's the H. And then these sides that are marked congruent are part of the right angles. So that's the L. So we don't need right angles theorem this time. We're just gonna use hypotenuse leg, which means those right angles just need to exist. They don't need to be congruent. If we're filling in our congruent statement, USR. Ooh, we're traveling the shared side, but then towards the pink before we get to the right angle. So I need to travel the shared side toward the pink before I get to the right angle. So this triangle's name would be SUT. All right, I can tell right away for this problem we're going to use the definition of angle bisector because we've got that word bisect in the given information. And so if we take time to think about BD bisecting angle ADC, that's a little bit strange. Angle ADC is actually a straight angle. So if that's true, that means these two parts of angle ADC are going to be congruent to each other. If we keep moving from there, we would have a right, or not a right, I'm sorry, a shared side that we could mark with the reflexive property. But then I'm noticing that we are a little bit stuck because we have two pairs of sides and one pair of congruent angles. But if that's the case, we're supposed to be dealing with a side angle side situation. And we definitely do not have angles located where the congruent sides intersect. That's happening up here at angle B. And so I'm going to assume that that means that these are not necessarily congruent angles. Although the fact that this is a straight angle means that we could do some more thinking about how big each of these angles are. What I'm thinking is probably more likely the case though is that this angle ADC was potentially a typo. If this had been a B, then our bisected angle would have been at the top and that pair of congruent angles would have been at the top and then side angle side would have worked out just fine. So Either way, that might be a good one to check in on with your actual geometry teacher to see if they change that to be angle ABC or if they did some more work with this um, straight angle that was bisected. Taking a look at the next one, I'm not seeing any vocabulary words, but I am noticing this X shape so we can use our vertical angles theorem to mark those angles. I'm not noticing anything else that's available to us to use in terms of midpoints or bisectors or isosceles or right angles. So I think this is going to be another one that's going to be a none situation because we don't have enough information if all we have is one pair of sides and one pair of angles. All right, finally, we're at our very last one. I see the word midpoint, so I'm going to go ahead and take care of writing down definition of midpoint. And then if we focus in on segment MQ, 
since that's part of the midpoint statement, we're going to be able to mark that these two segments are congruent to each other. We already have an additional pair of angles, so I think it makes the most sense to get our vertical angles on the picture since we have that nice X shape with our vertical angles theorem then as an additional reason. That to me gives us one pair of sides and two pairs of angles. So we're back to needing to make one last final choice between angle side angle and angle angle side. If we look at that pink side, it's connected to the vertical angles, but it's not connected to the ones that were originally marked. So that means angle side angle is out and this is an angle angle side situation. All right, one last congruent statement to finish. Triangle LOM. So from the single arc means that we need to start at N, then we're headed to O, which is the vertical angle, and then we're headed out to the end of that pink congruent segment. So our triangle name needs to be triangle NOQ. All right, you've officially made it to the end of in class 19. We'll see you back in class. Thanks for watching.